So Pete, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have you on. A common theme in the best coaches that I've seen are the exceptional at managing the mind of players in their team. And from that, I've always wondered how a good sports psych was go, would go as a coach. And you're someone who's actually done both of those at an exceptionally high level. And before we get into the guts of it all, I'd love to hear a bit more about your background as to how a young West Indian man has found himself travelling the world with the Australian cricket teams and also coaching Uni of Queensland to a ridiculous amount of success. Um, well, firstly, thanks for the, for the kind words about doing things at an elite high level. Uh, coaching, sports psych, the things that I've always been passionate about, well, I shouldn't, shouldn't say always, but over the past 10, 15 years of my life, pretty much from late school. Um, so it's nice to get the opportunity to do them at, at what I think is a high level. Um, but whatever level you're doing it at, you know, it, it's great where you get to challenge yourself. Uh, a bit about my, my background and how I came to be here. So I originally... Grew up in Barbados, I was born and raised there, Barbados in the West Indies. Uh, I lived there until I was 18. And then I decided to come and study in Australia. I thought Australia is the best in the world at cricket. Uh, I love cricket. A University of Queensland had a sports psychology course. Uh, so I applied there, I applied at Uni New South Wales, uh, University of Victoria, I think, and University of Queensland. Just basically places that I'd seen on TV because of test cricket. That's all I knew about Australia. So I applied there and UQ were the first to get back to me. And I saw that Martin Love played his cricket there and Michael Kaspervich played his cricket there. So I thought, you know, I'll have a piece of that. Um, and yeah, I just studied my undergrad and my postgraduate there at UQ. Uh, over periods of time at UQ, I was able to get different opportunities, you know, just helping out doing, you know, what they call it, batting coach or assistant coach, just when I was at uni and broke and they let you pay fees uh, and let you hang around and, and help out. Uh, they were really great in looking after me and providing me coaching opportunities. So paid, you know, let me know my level ones recommending me for level two, you know, eventually level three between Queensland Cricket and the club. So my coaching was able to develop and, and supported by University of Queensland really well. I played there, played second grade and then first grade for about four, so about five or six years at UQ and then hung out the boots. Um, I wasn't ever the greatest. I was never going to play first class cricket. I was just a decent, a decent first grade player. I was lucky enough to be part of a really successful, successful site. Um, and then, yeah, opportunities to coach the, the team and be the first director of cricket at UQ came around. And again, extremely grateful to the club for giving me those opportunities. And to be very honest with you, walked into a successful club when I was playing. Um, some great people before me, guys like Chris Teresi and Jared Turner, had set up a fantastic culture at the club. And so I was able to come in off the back of that. It's not like I developed success from a struggling from a struggling group. So you got to acknowledge that. We have a great... Um, a board that runs really competency or, or committee, uh, a really fantastic president in Jeff Tease, who's now on his way out, uh, great facilities, a great groundsman, all those things contribute to success. So as you'll hear in the themes of some of the things I speak about today, the input uh, that you have as a coach or as a sports site like, is only one cog in a massive wheel. Uh, so I wouldn't try to claim credit for our success. There's a lot of reasons for the success and I just try not to, to mess that up. Um, from a psychology perspective, as, as I said, I studied at University of Queensland. I did my undergraduate studies there. I did my postgraduate studies there as well. Um, I was privileged enough to get an opportunity at Cricket Australia, maybe three, three years out of, out of university. So I'd been working in a bit in dance and in performing arts. I worked at a university, Queensland University of Technology here in Brisbane. Uh, I do work with the Queensland Police. And then over a period of time, I got an opportunity at Cricket Australia. So that's become a main job over the past few years between that and coaching at UQ. So that's a very long-winded way of answering your question about how I came to be here. No, that's awesome. And you came across fairly young, so at 18. And from a playing perspective for yourself, did you have aspirations to play state cricket or were you pretty certain that grade cricket was your level? Oh, I definitely wanted to, you know, like any young man that fancies himself at cricket. Uh, I played some pathway cricket in Barbados, so I captain Barbados under 15 and under 16. I was lucky enough to be named to a West Indies under 15 squad. We didn't play any tournament. It was just a squad after the regional competition. Um, so I was a decent youth cricketer. And I came over at 18. And as I said, I started in, I played second grade my first season and a bit up and down in two, ones and twos the next year. And then first grade for, for four or so years. Um, I had some decent performances. I think, you know, just talent-wise, yeah, you thought, oh, if you really work hard and commit your whole life to it, you know, maybe I could be, maybe I could play at that level. But I wasn't in a, maybe I wouldn't, mind you. Um, but I thought I could have I given it a shake. 
but I was pretty content with what I had. I was I was lucky enough to play in a really successful side and, and contribute to a winning team from time to time. And that became became the level I was happy with. Other things in my life evolved, whether it be my work circumstances and my own financial circumstances and reasons why, you know, I stopped playing cricket at 24. Um, my motivations in life just changed. You know, I had different things that I wanted to, to spend a lot of my time on, but I still wanted to stay involved in the club. In the club so that's why I coach. I'd like to think my playing days aren't over forever. Love to have a run around in, in third grade or second grade, maybe in two or three years time. Uh, but my lifestyle at the moment dictates that I don't get the chance to play, but I can still coach and stay involved in that regard. So long story short, I got to a point where I really wanted to play at the highest level. I recognized what it would take to do that. Um, and the fact that you could do everything you could and still you know, not make it. And then I just looked at the other parts of my life and thought I'll invest a bit more time there. And from a personal level, I played to win. And, and again, we were lucky to be successful. We won all the different, you know, one day, T20. I'd lost, I'd been in finals where we lost the two day comp two years in a row. And then the third year, you know, we, we got back and we won it. And I just thought, I'm not really going to commit to trying to go any higher. So this is a good time to pull up stamps and let a young fella take that spot. Well, wow, that's, that's pretty young, 24, to pull up stumps, but it sounds like you're really aware of where you were in life, your motivations. You already had a fair bit of success at UQ. And within UQ, we might just go straight into that, in that you mentioned you walked into a really good culture um, at all levels, whether it's the curator, people at the board. From a coaching perspective, it sounds like you kind of grew with the club, even though you're playing there as well. How did you help develop that culture or what were the things within there that you noticed this is, this is what great cultures are made of? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think to, to answer the last part of your question first, the part of the club that I really wanted to, to latch on to identify with was this family element. I know everybody says that, you know, people say, oh, it's a family, it's this, but it truly was. I had times where I won't call names because I don't want to embarrass people. But people really looked out for me. There was a time where I was paying, I had international student fees. Uh, I didn't have three grand. And I needed to pay it like the next week. And somebody at the club, you know, who's now a good mate of mine, just, I didn't ask a question. He just saw me sit down and said, man, what's, what's wrong? Um, and I said, oh, it's all good. He, he pressed on knowing something was, up, was not up. And he found out and he gave me $3,000 just like that, you know, pay back when you can. So things like that. People giving me cricket gear when I when I couldn't afford a new bat and stuff when I was a uni student, you know, people buying drinks for you when you when you're out and you're young and you can't afford it so you couldn't stay out. Everybody just looked after me. I had a place to stay at Christmas, place to stay, you know, on different holidays, and people looked out for me really well. And not having my family here or my friends that I grew up with, the cricket club literally became my family, and that's what I was really attached to. And the other thing about the club which existed again before I got there was this this idea of the club is bigger. You know, it's not about you, it's about the club. So uni was a club where, because it was successful or became really successful, if you were playing second grade at uni, you know, we kind of, at least this is what we told ourselves, you could be playing first grade at another club. But in staying here, it helps us be strong and it helps us win. And it's not about you, man, it's about the club. And I really, I really bought into that. Um, and that's what did give us a lot of success. You had guys with four or five first grade hundreds playing second grade, you know, and being okay with that and actually enjoying playing, and whether it be helping a few youngsters come through or just winning at that level. So I was really attracted to the idea of, man, the club doesn't, doesn't owe you anything. The club's this family, it's where you get, meet these friends and you get an opportunity to play. So what can you do for the, for the club? Uh, being part of something that's bigger than yourself, I was really attracted to that. And then the coach, the guy who was the coach at the club when I came, Jared Turner, um, he was really big on, you know, on your standards. He had massive, he'll tell you, he had massive white line view when he was on the field. A uh, very competitive guy, but big on standards. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're playing third grade or sixth grade or first grade. We need to all train really, really hard. Take ourselves seriously in terms of how we train and perform. Not, don't take yourself seriously as a human being. Like, you know, the club's going to take the mickey out of you. You get pulled down real quick, which is great. But let's train really hard and let's perform as well as we can. It's not cool to be talented and lazy. It's actually really cool to work hard. Um, so those were the things about the culture that I love. And I just thought, well, I'm going to try and continue those messages. I became like head coach of the club in 2016, 17. And I carried on a lot of those same things. And then eventually you put your own spin, your own spin on it. But I was able to learn and watch, you know, what the club is about and be like, okay, I want to maintain that. 
and then you know you can get specific in you know the little flavor you want to add in the way you communicate the messages or if your group changes underneath you how you adapt this style but those key messages i wanted to keep going so it was pretty easy to just you know meld through and do a lot of the same stuff absolutely and you mentioned something there where you the players take your cricket seriously and have high standards but you don't take yourself seriously as a human. Now that can be really difficult to actually do. It sounds amazing in theory, but to be able to shift between actually, like I'm going to work hard, I'm going to be fully focused, fully in this, but I know that that's not fully relevant to how I am and how I'm valued as a person outside of it and that fun and enjoyment element. How do you actually go about creating that when it is really difficult in the first place? Great question. Um, I think if you have just like anything, any behavioral change, if you have a critical mass of people that expose a certain behavior, it's much easier for that to trickle down. And so I looked at the guys around us the whole time I've been at the club. Most people, you know, pretty well educated. They've got a job outside of cricket. They have a life outside of cricket. You know, people have a partner, have a family. And we had an older, we had an older demographic when I first, when I first came to the club. So people had this sense of identity and a life outside of cricket. So cricket is not the be all and end all. If I play poorly, I'm going home to my wife or my kids or whatever it may be, or to a nice, or to a job. I have some purpose outside of the cricket club. So you could be really serious at cricket and give it your all. And if you fail, be okay with that, you know, because it's not the end of the world, but you still give it your everything. I looked at that, that holistic kind of development. And that's something that we espouse now. Like, you know, we get our young fellas coming through that, man, it doesn't have to be uni, but if you're not doing uni or you're doing a trade, if you're not doing a trade or you're doing some kind of certificate to get a small business, are you, are you investing in yourself outside of the game? Because if you do that, then we can take this as seriously as we can when we're here between, you know, in the nets or in the field or cricket training. But after that, it's all gravy. You know, you go home to something else that's more meaningful um, or just meaningful in a different part of your life. So trying to continue to foster that holistic development, that's something that I think is really big and allows you to do that. And then also the sense that no matter how well you play, no matter what grade you're playing, man, it doesn't make you any better or worse a human being than the guy in sixth grade, you know, or the, or the lady in the women's club who's coming to train for her very first time. It doesn't matter. So we're really big on our first and second grade players getting down to a Tuesday and Thursday training when the rest of the club trains as well. I may go on field in a group with the sixth grade guys and get to know them and have a conversation. Because again, it just goes to show well, we're all equal human being status yeah we're not the same status of player and that's okay you work hard you go up and down with your merit with how good you are but as a human being we're all equal at the club and we'll pull down you know somebody gets too big for their boots in any way some young guys got a bit of you know swagger but you'll get ripped down real quick and the boys will take the mickey out of you um very very fast so it gets known that you can't get too big for your boots here everybody's on the same level as a human it doesn't matter what grade you play and that also means hey if you're on sixth grade that doesn't mean you don't work hard it's because you're in sixes, we don't care. Be the best you can be in sixth grade. You know, be the best you can be in third grade and second grade and first grade. So trying to keep holistically um, having some balance and also just trying to keep everyone on the same level as a human being. And I'm, and I'm not saying we get it right um, completely. You know, you may get an experience from someone else that could tell you something different, but that's what we try to do. That's fantastic. I, I love both ends of that, that the sixth graders, for example, work really hard still. You're still at those standards but also we're all humans and it's a concept we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast of horizontal relationships rather than vertical relationships. So it's like we, you might be further along the path of batting or bowling than I am, but we're all on the same path as humans and we're all just trying to get better and enjoy this time together. Um, it sounds like you guys have nailed that at UQ, but if we're moving on to, cause you're working with the Australian cricket teams where sometimes the consequences of performance aren't quite, uh, it's you're not just going home to mum or dad or husband, wife, kids. Those consequences are huge. So you can lose your contracts, you can get kicked out of teams, and the perception of that, particularly now when you guys are in bubbles all the time, can be large. So how do you go about, from a sports psychology point of view, helping the players at the top where there are real consequences to not performing well? So great question. And... I think it does change, you know, your context or your relationship with the game of cricket changes depending on what level you're playing at or what your ambitions are. Sometimes you get out of the club level, you will have someone playing first grade that is trying to break into first class cricket. They're a rookie player. 
Or you might have someone who has played first class cricket and they're trying to find their way back up to the top. Like when you go back to club cricket, for example. So that does happen. You do get a little taste for that at club cricket as well, where, yeah, cricket might be more than just the thing you do socially or try to do your best at from a hobby standpoint, but then you, you live with it. Yeah, so you do get a little balance in the first grade level. And I think when you step up either past first grade into professional or from national, sorry, state international, there is another shift. And what I try to talk to people about is, man, where does cricket now fit in your life? And what's your relationship with cricket? So if my relationship with cricket becomes financial now, that's going to have an impact on the way I think about the game. So I would encourage someone else to go. I'm not saying don't put cricket into you know, the basket of financial security. Don't let it be your only thing. That's what I would challenge them. Don't let it be your only thing. Because then when you go to bat, not only are you worrying about the guy bowling at you or the girl bowling at you, you're thinking, geez, if I don't play well here, I'm not going to have any money. And that's an, an extra layer of pressure or survival mode. And we'll talk about this a bit later. But your brain is not in survival mode when it's talking about financial security or safety. Again, what's your relationship with cricket in terms of your identity? So it's really different, at a, as you say, maybe at a club level. If I go to work and I'm a psychologist and I've got my mates, and because I live in the same place, I see my mates each weekend and my, I might see my family um, and that kind of stuff. I have my holistic development around me all the time. Whereas when you go to the national level, you actually miss out on a lot of that stuff. You, you, you're away. So you, you're not with your friends and family as much. You miss the birthday. You miss the, um, the birth of a, of a child even or something like that. You miss your mates and the, and the stability of being at home on the weekends and playing with your dog. All those little things. So now your identity with cricket, sometimes you can just see yourself as a cricketer. Because every day you wake up, that's the environment you're in. So you need to wake up, you go to training. Um, I finish training. And then we got an ice bath or recovery. Maybe we got a, a coaching session or analysis that we do. But cricket, 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 that's the whole environment around you. So actually, how do you peel back and make sure you invest in the other parts of yourself? You know, do not allow cricket to become, I'm not a cricketer. I play cricket, but I'm, I'm Peter Clark, right? That's, that's who I am, but I play cricket. Versus I am a cricketer. So identity is another thing that you got to watch. Um, so relationship with the not becoming financially dependent on it, not becoming dependent on it with your identity as well, and being deliberate in branching out so that that doesn't happen. I think that's really important to address uh, to your point of view uh, and keep investing in yourself outside the game. And it is more challenging when you're playing cricket, particularly in the spotlight and I, or, or elite sport. And the reason why, at least if I go to work and I'm, a, I'm an accountant, for example, just at some firm down the road, when you go to a friend's barbecue on the weekend, most people aren't interested in your work. Again, nothing's wrong with accounting. You guys do a great job in society. <laughs> um, but no one's going, hey, man, how, is he, you know, how many taxes did you do this week? Or I don't even know anything about accounting. But people just, they invest in you as a human. It's not really about your job. So you can switch off all the time. Whereas when you're a professional sports player and you're in the public eye, people are really interested in what you do. So you go to the barbecue and you're, you know, you're a famous cricketer or famous AFL player or whatever. Man, how was how that? It's actually hard to escape that part of your life gets seen as that because people see you do your job in the spotlight and it's something people care about or are invested in. So finding a way to, to switch off from that is unique and it is different to a lot of other jobs. So yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question exactly, but we've at least pontificated a little bit. Yeah, and no, absolutely. And that um, need to, it's just being a human being before the athlete, isn't it? So you spoke about the fear response in there when people are out there batting and they're thinking about the financial consequences or the emotional consequences. And particularly if you value yourself as an identity of being a cricketer and you get out, the problem is you lose your contract or in a bad run of form, you're no longer a cricketer, then who am I? And the brain starts to go and our bodies, that fight or flight response goes a bit nuts. So are you able to kind of explain what's going on in the brain when we are living in that fear response? Yeah, uh, well, I'll do my best to explain it. I'm not a neuroscientist, but by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but a basic, so a basic model I use to try to explain that kind of brain function or survival mode is something called a triune brain, a model called a triune brain. So it breaks the brain down into these three main areas and, and their purpose or function. So one part of the brain being the brain stem, so your brain stem into your amygdala, that's what's responsible for your fight or flight response or basically survival. Tied to your nervous system, extremely strong response 
you get a physiological response when that part of your brain goes off. The next part of your brain is your limbic system, and that's the emotional center of the brain. That's pretty strongly linked with the survival part of your brain, your brain stem. And then the final part being your, your prefrontal cortex and neocortex. That's the part of your brain where you make decisions, uh, complex decisions, problem solving, analysis, the things that we think about as, as uniquely human and that level of thought, that's the part of our brain that we need. So the access, when you're know, playing in the middle, you know, what's the field, what kind of shot am I gonna take on? That's the part of our brain we wanna be using. Now the oldest, strongest part of your brain is your brain stem, the first part I talked about, the survival part of your brain. That is hardwired to keep you alive. Um, so if you take us back from, a, from an evolutionary psychology perspective, the part of your brain that kept you alive and the survival part of your brain is your brain stem, right? This is what's tied to your, to your nervous system and all your functioning. And basically when there's a threat to your survival, that part of your brain goes off, right? If we had some scans on you, it'll light up and it activates. And once that activates, it won't quiet down until you've taken care of the threat in front of you. But if you think about it back in there, I've got a lion or a bear or it's freezing cold weather. My brain is telling me, mate, you've got to deal with this threat in front of you. So it locks in on that and it doesn't focus on anything else for, until you solve that problem. Fast forward all the way to now, our brain still has that as a default response. So there's a threat in front of me. It might be a threat to my spot on a team. It might be a threat to my ego. It might be a threat to winning the game in front of me. That part of your brain goes off, right? So the physiological response to that, you know, your heart starts racing, uh, your body's pumped full of adrenaline, your hands might get sweaty. What we would identify as, as nerves, um, that part, that, that happens, that process goes in. So what we need to learn to do over a period of time is how do I just quiet that response just enough? Because it has a purpose or a place, but how do I quiet that just enough so that I can access the part of my brain that I need to to help me make a really good decision? So you watch people out in the middle, that might be where you're doing your routines. Walking away from the crease, you're doing some deep breathing, um, you know, they may be singing a song to themselves, whatever doing something to just calm that response and then come back and focus your attention. If we don't have an ability to do that and that feeling stays with us, that emotion or level of anxiety stays with us, that's what turns into stress uh, and it clouds your judgment and, and impairs our decision making. Because when this part of your brain is in overdrive, this part of your brain is not working as it should. So that's basically the ebb and flow that you're trying to manage when you have this high level of nerves. And to go back to your early point of asking, well, why do we get that fear response and what does that have to do, for example, with, um, with if, I'm, if I'm depending on my contract for my survival? Well, it's one thing to have the threat about, you know, winning or losing the game. It's another thing to have your threat, you know, of being dropped from the team, maybe. Maybe even a threat to your own ego of, yeah, I didn't do as well, maybe not as good as I think. But it's another thing entirely to actually have it affect your survival. Now that part of my brain is really going to be an overdrive. If I'm thinking... No, 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 I won't have enough money to pay my mortgage or to send my kids to school or to, to buy food. Then that part of your brain is going to be really difficult to quiet down or manage. And so that's why it's really important to diversify, you know, whether it be financial security, social security, amongst your friends and peers and family, just to have a holistic kind of approach to your own development or your life. Because what it does is it makes sure that part of your survival brain isn't overly responsive to cricket. You can actually quiet that down in a logical manner because you know it's not really a survival. If it is your actual survival, that's going to be a very hard response to quiet down. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really interesting on the thoughts of over control as well. So when that fear, so from a bigger picture, so not just when you're out there in the middle of a game, but bigger picture, um, I'm say, for example, I'm out of form. And my response, and this is probably true, my natural response is I'm going to do more. I'm going to train more. I've got to go harder. I've got to hit more balls. I've got to run more. I've got to lift more weights. That doesn't always seem to work. And it seems to almost exacerbate that fight or flight survival response. Um, but at the same time, you just look around and read books or you listen to other people talk and they're like, oh, if you work hard. And society tells us that. And it's true. If you do the work, you're, you're going to get better. How do you manage that? In between phase of crossing the line into going too hard that's a great that's a great question it's a really individual i think the answer is there's no one size fits all answer it's a very individual process to go through i think there has to be some trial and error in that process to work out how it lines up for yourself um 
it also depends on the tasks that you do, right? So cricket is a complex task. There's a lot of decision-making involved, like we said before. You have to adapt to different conditions, different bowlers, different game situations. So there are certain things that have a straight correlation with, with work ethic, right? So for example, um, you know, if I lift a certain amount of weights at a certain intensity each week, you will get a certain amount of muscle growth, right? Oh yeah, there'll be some individual variability, but SNC coaches can give you a little bit of a, give you a program and a decent understanding of how that will work. A dietitian may say, you know, if you consume this amount of energy and then expend this amount of energy, this will be the weight loss or the weight gain. That's pretty concrete. Um, even when you take into consideration the individual factors. So yeah, work hard at that, do more of this, do less of that, pretty concrete outcome. Cricket, where you have to make complex decisions, um, and there's so many variables, like game situation or an umpire's bad decision, there's not this direct correlation between how hard I work and how good the outcome was for me on that particular day, right? Just because of the rules of the game. Better you can go there, you can make great decisions and you just get one that nips away, hits the outside edge. You're out for four. Uh, a bowler, you could bowl excellently on, a, on any given day. People drop catches off your bowling, people play a miss, they nick it for four. You get pretty ordinary figures, but you bowled well. So if my only determinant of if I was successful or not is the outcome, then I'm set up to fail in cricket because the outcome will not always reflect how well I played. Um, and that won't always reflect how hard I worked because it is complex skill with multiple variables. It's not this straight, you know, like a gym work, do this, this will happen. There's so many variables affecting the outcome. So that's why, to your point, working harder doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get a better performance. Now there's a, granted, there's a level of hard work everyone needs to do to prepare and be ready. But then if you know what it takes for you to be ready and you're not getting your results, working harder won't necessarily be the piece. You already know what works for you. So why spend more energy in a place that it doesn't? Um, there may be a need though, this is why it's variable. There may be a need, maybe you've got developed a technical flaw or there's an opponent that you face that's exploiting something in the way you play that you do need to spend time investing in. Um, so it's not a one size fits all answer. It's more looking at, well, what am I actually trying to do? What am I trying to improve? And, and will this thing help me? Will training more help me? Do I actually need to take a break because maybe my mind is tired when I'm out in the middle of playing and that's why I'm making poor decisions. Maybe I need more recovery time. No one can answer that question for you. It's something you kind of got to just learn about yourself so that you can start to make good decisions. Um, people like myself or great coaches or great teammates, they may bounce around ideas with you and help you find your way, but ultimately you've got to kind of make that decision. So does that make sense in terms of cricket not having that direct correlation with hit more balls, you'll play better? There's too many variables. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And it's something that's come up over and over again, to be honest, with a lot of the guests we've interviewed. And also just reading or learning about other athletes or people in spaces is the idea of being able to let go of the things that they can't control when it's a moment to step in the field. So we had like Beth Mooney, uh, Nicole Bolton, they're talking about hitting thousands and thousands of balls. And they love like that preparation is so, so important to them. But they have that moment where they switch on to game time and they can let go of that constant need and it's just about being here whereas meg lanning for example is like as long as my hit is quality i don't care it can be five minutes it can be half an hour i just want to feel good high quality and then it's about instinct and do you work with any of the girls or the guys on something really specific to be able to let go and to be able to surrender to whatever will be will be because that's a lot easier said than it is done yeah so i think what you're getting at is how do you actually reach the acceptance that we probably have less control over the outcome than we, you know, than we think? And how you actually make your peace for that? So you said, do I work on anything specific? You just kind of try and meet people where they're at, what works for them in helping them get there. For somebody, somebody that has a real spiritual background, you might go that approach. Someone who's very logical and pragmatic, you might just point out the, the different variables. So, so someone who's very pragmatic, I might say, can you control the decision that the umpire gives you? Nah. Can you control the ball that gets delivered to you? Nah. nah. Can you control the wicket that you play on? No. Can you control the game situation that you're going to be put into that you find yourself in? You bat three. You can go in at zero for one, or you could go in at, you know, 100. Oh, no. So all these things are outside of your, your control. What is within your control? Um, well, you know, the way I prepare, uh, my mindset, the decisions I make. And then the question you ask is, can you control the results? Some people might say yes. And then what I'll do is I'll dig a little deeper. Because when we talk about control, 
I mean, if I want to raise my left hand a hundred times in a row, I'll do that. That's control, right? Absolute control. Now you can have influence over your performance, but it can't have complete control. If not, everybody would average, well, wouldn't have an average because they score hundred or whatever, not every time. Every bowler would get 10, but it's just impossible. So there's, the outcome is not within my control. Now I can influence it by what I do, but where I put my attention, that's the important part. So you can come at it really pragmatically like that. Do I spend time in the influence? Or do I spend time thinking about the outcome? You can come at it from a spiritual standpoint. If someone is that way inclined and they go, yeah, you know, what is to be will be, or, you know, someone is, is religious and they say, you know, whatever's God's plan, whatever. You just want to get to the point of acceptance and you work with the person in front of you to help them get to that point. Because if we get to the point of acceptance of not being able to control the future, not being able to control the outcome, not being able to change the past, then what we do is we don't waste energy in an area of which you can't control. And you spend your time doing things that actually you can control and help you influence those uncontrollables the best that you can. Um, and there's a little principle I like to talk about called the 1090 principle. I, and it's not Stephen Covey's got one that's slightly different meaning 9010, and, and it means something slightly different to what I'm going at. Mine gets back to something called locus of control. And I've taken it from a famous American composer, Urban Berlin, who had a quote says, Life is 10% what you make it and 90% how you take it. And basically all he's getting at is, there's lots of stuff you can't control, you know, that'll happen and how you respond to that is really key. But the 10% where you make it, if you spend your energy there, you got your best chance to respond to that 90, right? So it's basic locus of control. Can I control this thing or can I not? And everybody gets this. Actually, our parents get this better than, than we do when we get older, when they tell you at cricket, you know, try your best off soccer. Just do your best, you know? And then you get older and you think that's not cool. You're like, oh, that's Mikey. Like, don't, you know, don't try your best. Do your best. Get, like, no, 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 that's actually true. All you can do is do your best. They don't tell you score 100 today or they don't tell you get five biggest. They say try your best. And they were right. Like, all you can do is control the way you prepare, the effort you give, the decisions you make. And then we live with the, we live with the results. That's brilliant. I, I really like that. And a lot of what, uh, we've been talking about as well is leading people back, particularly when they get to the high level, back to that little girl or little boy that started playing in the first place. And But I've never made that uh, connection from your parents actually saying, well, just do your best or just have some fun. Parents say that to you all the time when you're a little girl, but all of a sudden when you get older, all the noise starts to creep in. And sometimes that noise can come from coaches. Um, and that's something where I've Never really thought about it. I've always grown up, like coach someone you 100% respect, listen to them, learn from them. But sometimes coaches have the fear just as much as players do because their jobs are on the line or their um, identity as a coach could be on the line. Do you actually work with the coaches as well as the players or is that something that you just stay away from? No, 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 definitely. You spend a lot, you spend a lot of your time working with, I mean, if you've got a great relationship with them. So... One of the skills in, in psychology or any profession, really, how do you ingratiate yourself with the, with the people and the key stakeholders around you? Some of that will be on you as a practitioner in your field, whether it be s &C or physio or psychology. Some of that's on the coach in terms of their willingness to, to go into that area. But if you can find a really a decent relationship and understanding there, there is certainly a lot to work to be done in the coaching space where you know, you're dealing with people, as you said. They also say, this is really easy what we're doing. We're theoretically talking about emotion and fear and those kind of things. We're sitting separated from it, which is a great place to be, right? Where you can separate yourself from the emotion and see things really clearly and logically. If we think about what I said with your brain function before, this part of my brain is really free to operate right now because I'm not feeling these intense nerves. I'm not thinking about survival. So what we're doing, we're doing this in a vacuum. It's really easy for us to be clear. But what we know is that when the rubber meets the road and the results matter because you, as you said, your job might be on the line and that's a real, a real thing. Or you're a really competitive, competitive person and you want to win all the time. Um, you know, if, you, if you're new in a role and you're trying to establish yourself and you're thinking, well, if I do this, then the next thing comes. All these factors now drive emotion and that's when we don't think as clearly. And that's when we forget the basic principles that we've learned over a period of time. That's when we, the result or the outcome is so important now. We think we can, if we do more, we'll grab it or we'll get it. And that's a basic, you know, I don't want to say a human failure, but we all fall short in that regard, myself included. So it's not like 
hey, I'm here to teach coaches and for them to learn off me in this regard. I also need to learn off them. And where, where do I position myself well? When am I riding too high? Do I have a relationship with a coach who can say, man, you're doing a bit too much. Like I need you, I need you to peel back. Or a coach to say, man, I need you to give me a little something here in this moment. Um, can we have that two-way relationship? It's not like I'm here to inform and teach them how to do things. I'm a, I have some expertise in my area that I'll try and bounce around ideas with them and help shape stuff. And if they ask my opinion, but also the same way around, they can come back to me and give me feedback. And I can ask them for their opinion on different things too. So yeah, you, you're definitely right. It's not just players, it's coaches, it's everybody in their own field. We all feel the pressure to do your job well. Um, and if you're proud of your performance or you take pride in your work ethic, yeah, these are things that will pop up and provide challenges for us. Absolutely. And it sounds like relationships are so important. If we take it back to the start of the podcast, we're talking about UQ and how relationships and treating everyone on an even path is so important to now talking about coaches, particularly at the elite level. And for you to have those discussions, there seems to be some kind of vulnerability that would be really important in that. And people actually, that's a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but actually open up and say like, I need help, or is this working? This isn't working. And to be able to actually construct to where we're going, is that something you actively talk about, particularly if you've got a coaches that aren't, coaches or captains that aren't willing to open up and ask for help? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think to the first point, if you do have relationships uh, with people where you can be, you know, whether, whether you want to use the word vulnerable or actually just honest, like honest is a great word if I'm honest about what I'm feeling. Um, but it has to be a, a place where that's safe to do, right? People aren't going to come out. If, again, going back to that survival part of your brain. If I feel threatened, if I feel like, well, if I'm vulnerable or if I'm honest, if I say what I really feel or what's going on for me, how will that be taken? Am I going to lose my spot in the team? Am I going to get branded as a certain kind of person? Is that People are going to draw back. The survival part of your brain is telling them, nah, man, don't go there. And it's our job as a coaching staff or as a support staff or as a captain or as a teammate to create the environment where people do feel comfortable to share what's going on for them. Because that's the only way they can do anything about it. You know, so if I'm, if I'm really nervous, I'm really uncomfortable, if I'm feeling really flat um, or if I'm feeling really excited, if I can't express that to someone, I'm going to sit there with that level of whatever it is I'm feeling and it's not going to be But if I'm able to express it in some way, well, I can actually get past that and, and improve my performance or build better relationships. So we do have to create an environment where people feel comfortable and safe to express how they're feeling. And then the other piece around like relationships being super important. Yeah, we play team sport, you know, even an individual sport, you know, person's got a great relationship with their coach or with their SNC, but particularly for us that play team sport, how can you not have, how can you have a good environment or conducive environment for performance if you don't have great relationships with people. You know, I can't do my job. If, if I have no relationship with the coach, I can't do my job. If I have no relationship with the captain, I can't do my job. Or I can only do one part of it. So I work across, you know, mental health and well-being, individually for the players, um, you know, and even the staff to, to, to a certain extent. I work across performance, you know, that will be individual, individually with players. But then there's also some group themes that pop up. Is some work with the coaches or things that they might identify and pop up. We can bounce around ideas. I might work in the team culture um, or, you know, kind of team dynamics. I can't do the performance piece. I can't do the, the team dynamics piece. I can't do anything with the group if I don't have a relationship with the key stakeholders to that, to that group, which are in cricket. That's the captain and the coach. You know, that's, so I've got to maintain good relations with those people. I try to develop a good working relationship in order to do that part of my job. And so that's on me to try and bring what I can to the table to establish that relationship, to speak their language, to demonstrate value in that regard where they say, yeah, okay. It's useful me asking for this guy's opinion because you know, he, he gets it, he's framed it like this, he knows how to communicate with that. So yeah, I don't think you can exist in a team sport where there's multiple staff and multiple players if you don't have great relationships. And again, a great working relationship. You don't have to be best friends with everybody. That'd be a bonus. Um, but a great working or professional relationship where you ask for feedback. Like, so I've got to be, as you said, vulnerable. I've got to be open enough to know I'm going to get it wrong sometimes. I'm not perfect, man. I don't, so I've got to model the behavior I want to see. So I'm going to ask people, man, how do you think I went with that? Um, you know, time to time, just having a couple of trusted friends to say, yeah, man, you missed the mark with that one. Or to say, nah, I thought you nailed it. I need the coach to be able to tell me that. I need the captain. I need any player to be able to tell me that. And then I need to be able to tell them that, right? 
it's not a matter of me from a pedestal telling them what to do now. Nah. We have a relationship where you can tell me how I'm going and I can tell you and we can all tell each other. And if there's a safe space for that, we'll get better together. Um, so yeah, that's, and again, another long-winded way. You're going to start asking me questions because I go all around the world. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. There's a lot of gold dust in that, um, particularly the idea of it's not necessarily vulnerable, it's just being honest and also having the good working relationship. You're not going to, especially if you have a touring group of 20, 30, sometimes 40 people, not everyone's going to be best mates. Um, but how do we get to the point where we can have these conversations? And it sounds like um, you're on your way with the environments that you're working in. Um, and we've re reached the final few questions that we ask most of the guests that come on the podcast. Um, so the first one is, um, what's the impact that you'd like to have on the next generation? As in the next generation of creators or the world? They oh, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Or the, the, whatever's coming up. So kind of like how important is legacy to you? Yeah, um, I think I think about that a lot in my job at Cricket Australia, particularly working in with whatever team I work in, uh, or at cricket with my cricket club. The cricket club in particular, I want to leave a legacy or what I want to pay is pay it forward. Every I got all these opportunities and great things in my life, so a sense of community, a sense of purpose in what I do, um, doing something meaningful that's bigger than myself, friends, family holistic development i get all that i got all that from the credit club um, and the people there so that's what i try and pay it forward so giving you know, you know the, the youngsters that come through giving them my time talking to them about life if they want to if they want to talk to me about it um giving them all of my time to throw them balls to do as many sessions as they want to do to invest in themselves outside the game just being available for them as i felt many people are available for me and then creating as many opportunities as i can for them whether that be playing opportunities whether that be an opportunity to invest in themselves outside the game, just giving them opportunities. If people can leave it going, yeah, you know what? He paid it forward. He got plenty of stuff from the club and he kind of paid it forward and try to give that back. that will be a win. Um, I think in the, in my professional environment at work, again, if I could leave a legacy of just a person who knows who's just modeling the behavior, of, I don't know everything. I'm not trying to know everything. That's actually not the point. The point is, do we actually, can we speak to each other on, a, on an even keel or even footing and just bounce around ideas? I think if we do that and then leave everybody the, the choice to individually go about their business, then that's a win. So just trying to inform a, a culture of that in the place to operate. Everyone's opinion, opinion is important. Everyone's entitled to find their own journey and they actually have to drive that. And can we just be collaborative in the way we bounce around and share ideas to allow people to do that? Um, and excel in their role. Absolutely. And what is high performance to you? Good question. Um, well, I guess if you look at the word, let, let's say performing as, performing as well as you can. I think if we think about it in a professional set, setting, performing as well as you can, as consistently as you can. That's what we're trying to achieve. So then what do you put around that? That's probably your question. What do you put around that to achieve performance? And I think, again, that's extremely variable depending on the person and depending on what you do. Somebody might be really functional with not much because they're very, you know, self-sufficient. They, they're internally motivated and driven. They're driven by performance. Somebody else might be driven more by the social aspect of things or likes learning, whatever. Everyone's got different strengths. So high performance to me is, how do I work out with the people who I'm trying to get the consistent high performance? How do I work out what they need and provide that or facilitate that in some way? That's a high performance system and it doesn't have to be just cricket that's any kind of field or job that you do brilliant and who is pete at his best jesus uh who's pete at his best well as you can tell in this podcast i'm pretty talkative uh, <laughs> i like engaging i don't know if i'm at my best then i just like engaging with people I like being around people i like engaging with other people and making people laugh and help people get the best out of themselves that's what really gets me, gets me going. Uh, also, I'm a, extremely competitive, as any of my mates would tell you. You know, Monopoly, table tennis, anything, I'll, I'll compete. Uh, so I'm competing when I'm at my best for sure, and just being around people and helping them, helping them be their best. So laughing, having a bit of fun, but also connecting. Uh, yeah, that's probably me at my best. 
Absolutely. And Pete, I've heard incredible things from almost every single person I know within Australian cricket about the work that you're doing, but more importantly, the presence you have and the impact that you've had on them through your work so far. Um, so I'm really excited to see you continue impacting, continue helping the next generation as well. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, man. It's been awesome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast with our guest, Peter Clark. I really love this episode and how he connected so closely with what Beth Mooney talked about last week in this concept of deep humility. When Peace talked about his work with UQ, he had no claim of being the big dog applying all of his sight tricks. Um, and he rather acknowledged how it's a whole club thing in that the first graders, it doesn't make you a better human than the sixth graders. And conversely, I really liked how he said the sixth graders, it doesn't mean that you drop your standards. So everyone's on the same path and everyone has their right to high performance the end outcome is different. Someone in sixth grade may not be able to bowl 140 clicks on a dime, but he has the same capability to achieve those standards. At the same time, everyone looks after each other. And that's a concept of deep humility in a team setting, which I really enjoyed. The second part that was really important to the cultures that Pete's been involved in is this power of acceptance and the acceptance of what you can control and acceptance of what you can't control. And the 90-10 principle of life is 10% what you make it, 90% how you take it. And particularly at this time where we're still in a COVID world, in elite sport, there's so much noise and there's so much that's out of your control, that ability to actually dial in on that 10%. And if I'm honest, it's probably less than 10%. The ability to really understand at a deep level of what you can control and directing all your attention to it is the key, in my opinion. And I really love how Pete talked about the other 90%. It's all about acceptance. That's the hardest part to reach to, where can you accept that you can't control certain items? Can you accept that you can't control the outcome? Even sometimes you may not be able to control where you land the ball because your rhythm's out or your thoughts are going crazy. You're not 100% in control of your thoughts, for example. That chimp or that monkey in your brain can go at a million miles an hour, but what you are in control of is the ability to step back and actually reassess, create space, the space between stimulus and response, and then choose a response that's useful in that moment. So it's not always about good and bad. It's about what's useful and what's not useful. What's my task here? How can I actually accomplish it? How can I take the right steps to be able to accomplish it? And that's a skill. It takes time to practice over and over again, just as acceptance is a skill. So the ability to actually accept what's not in your control, and that's something you can do daily. So whether it's taking out your journal and say, today I surrender, I, I accept that some things are completely, utterly out of my control, but make a list. This is what's in my control today. And I know a lot of people in Melbourne and Sydney have been struggling at the moment and the ability to actually write down what is 100% in your control. And today your measure of success is can I dedicate 100% of my attention and my focus on these things that I can control? And at the end of the day, look back at how well were you able to let go of all the noise that came in and be fluid with that. It's not about being perfectly structured. It's about being fluid and being able to move from one thing to the other, moving like the wind, like some of the best athletes in the world. When you watch Federer play, when you watch Djokovic play, they're not fully structured. They're able to move and they're able to adjust with what's in front of them. So the third part I really enjoyed with our conversations, Pete, today is when he talked about the neurobiology of our fear response. And what happens is when there's an external stimulus, something is triggered in us, we activate that fear response because it's a threat to our survival, our belonging, our basic human needs. Um, and our amygdala, which is part of our brain, that actually means almond because it's like the shape of an almond, um, activates a whole chain of responses in our body called the sympathetic nervous system. And that can be really useful. So sometimes nerves are useful. It pumps out blood to our extremities. It allows us to narrow down our focus into a deep focus. All of these things are really good for performance. But what happens when that's out of control? It actually can cross the line past your optimal level of performance and that's when you get things like choking or freezing or maybe you go the other way where you want to just go absolutely nuts but it's totally out of control and you can't actually access your prefrontal cortex which is the part of your brain that makes really rational and calm decisions so a really cool example is a lot of people you'll see one of your teammates play an absolute rush shot and everyone on the side and I was like why did he do that I was so dumb it's probably because his fight or flight system his sympathetic nervous system was in overdrive which meant that that rational decision-making element is not quite there. So we need to put in some processes that allow us to be able to calm that side down if we do go over the top. 
and therefore create space between stimulus and response. And a lot of research, a lot of studies, everyone comes up to a really similar conclusion. The most effective way to do this is by bringing yourself back into the present moment. And this is something you can actually train, which is really exciting. So you can train your brain and there's MRIs and all sorts of brain studies showing how different parts of your brain light up when you train your brain to deeply focus in the now. And that can be through typical meditation where you're sitting on a chair and actually completely focusing on your breath. It can be just at training. So how about at training, instead of always focusing on technique, you're focusing on simply being present to one ball at a time. Your mind gets distracted, let it get pulled out, just let it pull back to the present moment. And training this over and over and over again. So studies have shown you need a minimum of about eight minutes of that deep focus to start to have the physiological effects on your brain. Um, this can influence your ability to calm down that amygdala, that chimp or that fight or flight response and actually allow you to then make rational decisions under pressure. So I hope you got something out of the podcast today. I really love talking to Pete. His energy is incredible. He seems to really be passionate about what he's doing, which is why I think he has such a great impact on the people around him. And as always, if you enjoy the podcast today, please leave us a review if you're on Apple Podcasts. If not, flick me a message on Inside Edge Project on social media or at www.insideedgeproject.com. I hope to see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to continue to be part of the Inside Edge project, hit subscribe or leave a comment below. We're also on all major social media platforms. I look forward to having you along next time.